I don't know what those white people in this country feel. But I can only include what they feel from the state of their institution. Now, this is the evidence. You want me to make an act of faith, risking myself, my wife, my woman, my sister, my children, on some idealism which you assure me exists in America, which I have never seen. Welcome back to another episode of Black History for White People, a podcast where we educate, resource, and challenge white people about black history. I'm Brad, and on today's show are my co-hosts Katina and Garen. Today's topic is Confederate monuments. We first go over the historical context of the Confederacy, why they built so many monuments, and then we end it with giving some helpful thoughts on what to do with the remaining monuments that are still standing without erasing history. We hope you enjoy the discussion. Garen, can you paint the picture for us? What's going on? What's uh, in the country? What, what's happening in the time frame when we're talking about Confederate monuments? That's a great question. Um, the Confederate monuments actually didn't go up, for the most part, right after the Confederacy, uh, right after the Civil War. Uh, most of them went up uh, in the 20th century, early 20th century. Um, there were some that went up before that, and we'll talk about those um, a, a little bit later on. But the context in the early 20th century is uh, Jim Crow laws and white supremacy. That there was a very overt and kind of in-your-face white supremacy during that time. Um, Like there was segregation, black people were being lynched, terrorized, uh, forcefully segregated. Um, There was not a even a pretense of uh, equality or uh, any of that that we... um, had later on in history. Um, the other part uh, of the history that you have to kind of understand briefly, we're not going to get real deep into it, but the Civil War, uh, first of all, was fought over slavery. Um, some people have like tried to repaint the narrative of what happened in the Civil War um, to be about states' rights or about um, like federal overreach. Um, yeah. But... Uh, if you look at the actual ces- cessation documents that the states who seceded, they actually had statements on why they were seceding. Um, uh, it was fought over slavery. Um, the South left the Union because they knew they could see the writing on the wall that um, abolition was coming, that uh, they would, were going to lose their slaves. The North, the, the nuance is that the North was not entirely fighting the war to end slavery, they were fighting the war to keep the Union together. But the South seceded because of slavery. So on the part of Southerners, they were fighting to maintain their slaves in slavery. Northerners, um, they emancipated the slaves uh, tactic, to gain a tactical advantage over the South. Lincoln freed the slaves in the South in hopes that um, that would help recruitment um, for the Northern cause. But his purpose, Lincoln's purpose, was to keep the Union together. Um, it, it, Lincoln did want to end slavery, but he wanted even more for the Union to stay together. Um, and so his priority was keeping the Union united. Yeah. Um, so, th- But this is where we have to almost get into like a little bit of a conversation over how history is recorded and uh, how history is shaped and changed. Because the narrative that that the reality of what happened has been kind of uh, bleached and whitewashed and changed over time. So this, we we talked a little bit about last week in the Tulsa episode that um, everyone wants to tell a story about themselves and about their lives that makes them a good guy. Yeah. Nobody wants to admit like we were on the wrong side of history, Mm -hmm. we're terrible people. Um, so in the South, there was, uh, there was all these states in which they not only were on the wrong side of history in supporting slavery, but they also lost the war. So it was like a double whammy of like, we lost and we also supported the dehumanization of people who are now equal citizens with us. Mm-hmm. And so they had to deal with that through rewriting some kind of history that made it so they could live with themselves. And so that what we got was um, something called the lost cause. It was uh, just referred to on both sides as the lost cause, which was basically a new narrative, a reinterpretation of the history of the Civil War and of its aftermath. 
Um, and it was a new narrative that made Southerners kind of the good guys. Kind of like, it was like, uh, it dealt with both of those parts, that we were evil and we lost. So the way it dealt with like the evil of slavery was by romanticizing slavery. Uh, the Lost Cause kind of told all these stories of and saturated culture with all these stories of like happy slaves who were willing and submissive and happy to serve their masters and benefited from slavery. It talked about the, the tutelage of the inferior race and how slavery was over the course of centuries going to raise black people up to something of uh, being civilized. Um, it talked about um, Southern culture and just glorified Southern culture. Um, and is, is this a like they're teaching this in schools, or is this just like a general narrative that people are yeah. pushing? Yeah, no, they taught it in schools. The it was uh, pushed a lot by the United Daughters of the Confederacy, was an organization that formed in the um, what 1890s, um, and it grew to a membership of like a hundred thousand uh, women and. It had, uh, they like actively promoted the Ku Klux Klan. Um, they built the majority, or um, I think they, they single handedly maybe built the majority. There was a couple organizations that were building Confederate monuments, but they built a majority of the Confederate monuments that went up in the 20th century. Um, and they also, uh, a big keystone of what their movement, what their organization did, was to uh, put school curriculum in the schools. Um, so they taught this narrative in the schools that basically slavery was um, not so bad. Southern culture was like great. The North just wanted to like control everything. Um, and then they had to deal with the, the fact that they lost the Civil War um, by basically saying, we didn't really lose the Civil War. We lost, a, like, they, they almost made the Civil War itself a battle in a bigger war. And that bigger war was the war of white supremacy. And so they said basically, well, we lost the Civil War, we lost that battle, but ultimately we overcame Reconstruction, we overcame Northern interference, Northern intervention, and we won the war of white supremacy. Um, so I have a, a quote here. Um, At a 1927 dedication ceremony for a federally funded statue of Jefferson Davis, a Confederate statue, um, the senator from Mississippi, John Sharp, said the following quote, um, the cause of white racial supremacy, which is not a lost cause, he's referencing that lost cause re- like myth of history, he says, it is a cause triumphant. It was never as safe as now. So he's basically what saying- was, What year was that? 1927. Okay. So like three generations after the Civil War, the Confederate monument being dedicated and the senator from Mississippi is saying, we didn't really lose the war. The real war was white supremacy, and that's not a lost cause. We are winning that war. We're maintaining white supremacy. Well, and it's just interesting how the revision of history continues. I mean, we've heard about uh, people, enslaved people being called immigrants in curriculum, um, and just this dumbing down the whole history of racism, white supremacy, what really happened. Everybody's arguing that, oh, you know, the Civil War wasn't about slavery. It was about states' rights. Well, all the the, the states who uh, were, uh, who joined the Confederacy, their biggest issue was slavery. Mm-hmm. Or, oh, right. And, 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 and basically how slavery impacted their state or their area. Um, but it's just been amazing how people regurgitate that even now. Um, and then there was this movement, like you said, to present this whole happy darky, you know, this is what they called black people then, you know, just this, the slaves are happy and they're singing. I mean, even in the movies, like the silent movies in black and white film, you know, these black people that were just so protective of their masters and so happy to be enslaved and would fight other black people because they, you know, loved their enslavement. But then you have, um, I think, I'm, I'm not sure who went, the slave narratives, the slave narratives where they went across the country and they recorded different stories from people who had been enslaved. And you see the, like, hor- like it was horrific, some of the things that people went through. Um, and that was done to kind of counter um, a lot of the propaganda 
that was put out there about what slavery really was. Mm-hmm. I, th- yep. I think what's interesting is that I think a lot of our listeners would probably think just the term white supremacy, like nobody actually says that. Like, so how do we know? It, it's almost like we're just, imp- we think that what people were trying to do was just kind of put white people in power and stuff. But it's, it's honestly a little kind of mind boggling to hear that even in the 1920s, and it's not surprising, but it's like, you know, this guy actually used the term white supremacy. It's not like we're coming back a hundred years later and saying those guys, those people are white supremacists, but it's like, they're literally using the language. Mm-hmm. I am a white supremacist. They wore it as a badge. Yeah. That's almost mind boggling because I, mm-hmm. I don't know. We don't, I don't, I don't hear a lot of stuff about, I mean, that's, yeah. Kind of surprising to me. Let me give some more quotes because uh, for any skeptical listeners, I think quotes are helpful to like put you in this moment where you're like, yeah, these are real the humans. words of people. Yeah. Um, so Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy, said in what is now known as the Cornerstone Speech in Savannah, Georgia, 1861. So front end of the Civil War, he said uh, of the Confederacy, its foundations are laid. Its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is the natural and normal condition. This is our government, or this, our government, is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. And then, let's get some more. The the Constitution of the Confederacy said... In all such territory, the institution of Negro slavery, as it now exists in the Confederate States, shall be recognized and protected by Congress. So, pause on that. It was not about states' rights. Because the Confederacy was literally saying, all the states, in our Constitution, all the states are required to have slavery. Which is not giving the states the rights to decide whether they even want slavery. It's like a federal institution within the Confederacy making their states all have slavery. Um, Really, it was about slavery. Um, Texas, when Texas seceded, they said as part of their um, cessation documentation, their their casus belli, they said, in this free government, all white men are and of right ought to be entitled to equal civil and political rights. That the servitude of the African race as existing in these states is mutually beneficial to both bond and free and is abundantly authorized and justified by the experience of mankind and the revealed will of the Almighty Creator as recognized by all Christian nations. Mississippi, when, in, when they seceded, our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest of the world. Its labor supplies the product which constitutes by far the largest and most important portions of commerce on the earth. So the Civil War was about slavery, but that story was rewritten and part of that rewriting of history was putting Confederate monuments all over the country, not to uh, remember history of what had happened, but rather to create a new triumphant narrative and to maintain white supremacy by intimidating, intimidating black people, kind of the same way that gangs mark their territory. Um, white supremacists very overtly and like in quotes you can show that they were doing this like it wasn't secretive back then they were putting up confederate monuments to mark their territory Um, so let's talk for a second about monuments right because the, the big argument today is that confederate monuments are to remember history and we just need to like think a little bit more critically for a second about monuments that are put up around the world and the purposes for which they're put up. Um, Monuments are not all there to communicate history, but some of them are. So there's different purposes that monuments can go up. Um, They can go up to show who's boss. Like example would be Saddam Hussein statues that were put up to show I'm in charge. They can be put up to honor historical figures like the Lincoln Memorial. Um, They can be put up to institute national pride like the Mount Rushmore. Um, They can be put up to intimidate, like raising a flag over a fallen city. They can be put up um, to memorialize the dead, like the 9-11 memorial or the legacy memorial that EJI has in Montgomery. 
Um, they can put, be put up to communicate history, like in museums. So the question of which statues, which monuments should come down and shouldn't come down, I think a lot of people don't think of it with enough nuance because they just, uh, we don't want, I think on the right, the fear is like, well, where does it end? If you start taking sta down statues of right. everyone who's imperfect, well, everyone's imperfect. So yeah. then you'd have to take down all statues. But I think that that's uh, not a nuanced approach. And it's uh, right. the, the reality is some statues are put up to honor people. Some are put up to mark your territory. And so the, the, the conversation, it, or the, the, the question should be, for each individual Confederate statue, um, to, to just look at why it was put up. And I think it will very quickly... Um, and and other statues too, and I think it'll very quickly um, the question will kind of answer itself over which ones should come down or not. Um, Confederate monuments, very early on, um, the very early Confederate monuments, um, right after the Civil War and the years following the Civil War, the ones that were put up generally were put up by people who actually knew the dead, and generally they weren't marked as Confederate monuments. They were often obelisks that were put up in um, grave sites. And they weren't put up to intimidate. They were actually put up to honor the dead. So I think those ones are a little bit of a unique case. But later on, after the United Daughters of the Confederacy, the monuments that were put up were put up with these big published white supremacy celebrations. In They were generally put up in courthouses, like 300 courthouses across the South got Confederate monuments. Um, every single state capital in the former Confederate states has uh, their state capitol grounds were littered with Confederate monuments. Um, they were put up with the express purpose to intimidate. And so I think they should come down. And they also were put up as black people were uh, progressing, like as black people were coming out of um, enslavement and, and building their own um, towns and schools and getting, you know, degrees, trying to run for office, and really trying to establish themselves as a people, um, an independent people. Um, and so I just think that the campaign of the Confederacy was running alongside Black people making progress and headway, um, and that the Confederacy was like trying to counteract that and to continue to push this idea that Black people were um, inferior and incapable. Um, and then as we talked about Tulsa and all the various cities where um, and towns where black people's um, homes were burned down, like all of that coincided. And so people are always saying, you know, we can't forget our history. Our history is still very much alive. White supremacy is very much alive. What history are we not trying to forget. Like, why are we trying to honor a, a history of white supremacy? We don't need, like, we don't need to honor white supremacy. We we just need to tell the truth of mm -hmm. the stories. We don't need to have monuments to remind us. Like, there was a writer, and I forget her name, maybe we should look her up, but she said, my black body is a Confederate monument because my I have rape-colored skin. Um, you know, my skin tone and and many black people's skin tones is a product of the rape um, and the, you know, just the horrific um, circumstances of enslavement. So she's saying my skin is like some kind of like mid-tone because white masters raped my black female ancestors. Yes. Um, and so my skin itself, my DNA is like a, a testimony to what the Confederacy is. Yes, was her about. name is Carolyn Randall Williams. She said, You want a Confederate monument? My body is a Confederate monument. The black people I came from were owned and raped by the white people I came from. Who dares to tell me to celebrate them? Like, read that article. People want to, you know, keep monuments up to remember something so horrific, to remember domestic terrorism, to remember genocide. Why do we need monuments to remember that history when that history is still very much with us as Black people are still processing and trying to peel back the layers of, of trauma um, that, that we endured, mm -hmm. um, that we had to you know, go through? Mm -hmm. so. 
Something you said a minute ago was uh, that Confederate monuments were often in response to progress that black people were making. And just to kind of lay into that point a little bit, um, in Texas here, in the years from 1963 to 1965, so height of the civil rights movement, there were uh, 27 Confederate monuments that were put up in just those three years, um, which is like, I think at that time, like a, a third of all of them that had that existed at that time. Mm -hmm. So just a huge boom that was very obviously in response to the civil rights movement. Um, Or uh, a lot of you listeners you know or are familiar with um, schools that are named after Confederate figures. And there was a, a huge boom in the naming of schools after Confederate figures that was directly in response to Brown versus Board of Education and desegregation of mm-hmm. schools. Mm-hmm. So the Supreme Court says um, we're going to desegregate the schools. And then in the decade following that, um, something like uh, half to a third of the schools that ended up getting renamed to after Confederate figures are in that decade. Yeah. Um, just very, it's just like a big a big spike in the number of schools being renamed after Confederate figures. And it's because there's these all-white schools where no black people have integrated in yet and the the white parents want to do whatever they can to signal, like, don't come here. You're not welcome here. You're not going to come into our school. So they put up um, Confederate monuments on school grounds. Uh, they And they rename the schools after Confederate figures with, like, the purpose was to intimidate yeah, and um, it's just interesting that, like you, like we were saying, that as black people were making progress, as black people are fighting for civil rights, and during that time in the '60s when so much, so much happened. I mean, Martin Luther King and, Be- and Medgar Evers and Rosa Parks and um, John Lewis and all these different figures are coming forward and we have television, more people have television in their homes. They're seeing these riots um, played out. They're seeing black people uh, being hosed down, which I think a lot of that, like being able to get that visual, just like right now doing the Black Lives Matter movement where we're using social media to film um, these interactions, um, people's conscious, like, it, it the conscious of of the human mind like we're being it's being seared um and so you can't just say that something doesn't exist because you're having to look at it and grapple with it and so these confed, confederate monuments are are like a posturing it's like you know deer when they pee in the forest they're basically establishing their territory and so as people are gaining, like, as, as the movement is gaining um, ground and as people are changing their minds about racism and white supremacy, then white supremacists are like, we got to do something. We got to put something out there. We got to, you know, we got to we gotta have Klan meetings in churches. We got to have can- Klan rallies. We got to recruit people. We got to keep people on our side. We got to make sure that people know that black people are inferior. And so out of it comes these white... Um, leaders of the Confederacy that people want to herald and celebrate. Robert E. Lee, they're they're naming school. We have a we have a, a Robert E. Lee Elementary School right here in Denton. Um, we want to you know, and we we want to say that Robert E. Lee was such a noble man. Like he was a horrible man. He owned slaves, um, and he was you know uh, the key one of the key figures of the Confederate Confederate Army. I just feel like. You know, there's definite, like, the more progress that you see that black people are making um, after slavery uh, through the 60s, the more effort you're seeing from from white supremacists and white supremacy to basically define their territory, that this country is ours um, and that, you know, we're, we're superior. I mean... You think about the daughters of Confederacy, many of them were teachers, that this that they would go to the extreme to make sure that this is put in curriculum. Um, and that they um, that, that they basically made Confederate ideals um that they masked it as uh patriotism. Mm-hmm. It's 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 insane. Yeah. And 
for our listeners, it should not surprise you that school curriculum in the South would rewrite history. Like, if you actually understand how history is written down, like a lot of times, I think we just think that history is this this objective narrative of what happened, but that's not how it works. Um, in the South, you had this like 11 states that had left the Union and now the North has left. There's no longer any federal intervention and they get to write whatever history they want to write about what happened. So why would you think it would be accurate? Right. Like it's almost, it would almost, the crazy thing would be if they actually did write an accurate history of what would happen. That would be what would be surprising and unexpected. Um, and then the story that the, that the South wrote, um, it did just kind of like, Gain broader acceptance than even in the South, um, and so now it's like debated today. Uh, what happened? Let's even talk about why it gained um, so much acceptance. Yeah, uh, nationally. Yeah, and uh, because the union, they, you know, we we want to say that the the union they cared about people being enslaved, and you know that they they were abolitionists. Like that's so far from like Lincoln himself. He didn't care about people being enslaved. He um, wanted to do whatever he possibly could to keep the uh, Confederacy from seceding, and then there was he—he he basically had to make make a, a choice. Um, but it wasn't about freeing enslaved people. Um, it was about economy. It was about politics. It was about you know everything but <laughs> in the enslavement enslavement of black people. But the fact that you know we we want to make racism. Um, we want to limit it to the South. And white supremacy existed in the North. It thrived in the North. It still thrives in the North. Um, it may look a little different sometimes, but it still exists in the North. We, we have this idea that slavery, um, that people, that, that Northerners were against slavery, and they weren't against slavery. They were just for the United States. That's all. You know, and and black people, we're the we were the collateral damage of the war. Mm. Like we, you know, yeah, that is so true. I mean, in so first of all, Lincoln, I think he had like probably a preference for the Union to be uh, abolitionist to to end slavery. Yeah. But there's quotes where Lincoln said basically in his pragmatic thoughts. You, you can read places where he said basically the union is not going to be sustainable being half slave and half free right? because there's too much tension, too much division. So in order to have a united union, we eventually have to pick one or the other. And so he knew that it wasn't like stable. But, and I think his preference was, well, if I have to pick one, I'm going to pick abolitionists. But he was, his priority was to keep the union together he wasn't like this like hero of the you know of civil rights he was no. uh fine with white supremacy he probably would even have said he believed in white supremacy he made white asked. supremacist comments yeah that yeah. are documented and in the north it was uh easy for the north as a whole to be against slavery because that's not what their economy was based on exactly they didn't have a financial motive to have slaves Yep. But later on, whenever there was financial reason to oppress black people, they very quickly did. Yes. When black people moved up to the north, they segregated them all into uh, urban ghettos and then used policies, government policy, both federal, state, and local policies to oppress and suction wealth out of the black communities there. Yes. So the, the north was not heroic. The South was evil, but those two things are true at the same time. Like I think uh, sometimes people uh, who like want to defend the South say, "Well, look at the North. It wasn't really about slavery, so the Civil War wasn't really about slavery." But it's like, no, for the South, it was. Even if the North, it wasn't really about abolition. Yeah, and it, and for the South, if it was about tobacco and cotton, then it was about slavery. If it was about Southern economy, then it was about slavery. And so many of the Southern states, they would use this language that was not about slavery, but it was about slavery because their whole economy and 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 just their flourishing depended on slavery. Um, mm -hmm. So they could say whatever they want, but it all literally tied to slavery. Yep. And for the North... 
I mean, they let out in gentrification. Um, I mean, just I'm thinking about like Harlem, how, you know, Harlem has been gentrified and they want to change the name and they want to strip the history. And there were um, towns in there was a town like in New York, in Harlem, um, you know, just the gentrification issues and wanting to rename and erase that history, that's in the North. That's in New York. Mm-hmm. So let's change the the topic a little bit to talking about the Confederate flag because it like is intertwined yeah. with Confederate monuments, um, but related. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but but basically the Confederate flag, first of all, um, the, the Confederate flag as we know it was not actually the flag of the Confederacy. It was the Confederate battle flag that was used on battlefields by some of their armies. They actually had a variety of battle flags. So it was just the one that we're familiar with today is just a flag that was used by the Confederacy, but it wasn't ever the flag of the Confederacy. Right. Um, but it was the one that was widely used uh, during this whole era in order to intimidate black people and establish white supremacy. Um, so first of all, uh, 90% of black people in a recent poll said that they interpret the uh, Confederate flag as being racist. So, uh, and uh, along with that, 55% of white people. Um, so, the regardless of the history, which we'll talk about the history in a second, like if you want to fly a flag that 90% of people interpret as being like racist, that's like, Unloving. <laughs> That's like unkind. It's uh, evil. Yeah. It's like there there are millions of Americans who have trauma from this history. And regardless of what your personal motives are, if something is going to be hateful to all these people who see it, it doesn't matter if your reasoning is that I'm supporting this history. It's a symbol of oppression. Mm-hmm. And it, that's literally it. It's a symbol of oppression. And how has it been allowed to... And, and it's a symbol of um, of being a traitor. Like, it's a traitor symbol um, to America. I don't even understand the logic of how it's been allowed to flourish and be put on um, and romanticized and put on shot glasses and worn as a belt and <laughs> and flown at state capitals when it's a symbol of oppression. Like in Germany, are there swastikas flying around? Mm-hmm. Are there, you know, are there um, um, statues of Hitler? And people want to say, well, there's no comparison. There absolutely is a comparison. And the Holocaust, not to compare, you know, the horror, because it's all horrific, but the Holocaust lasted for a certain period of time and, uh, you know, a very few years. And uh, slavery lasted, you know, for, what, 200 and something years and then Jim Crow and then uh, redlining and then, like, all the the things that contain mass incarceration, convict leasing, like... It's a symbol of oppression. Mm -hmm. It's a symbol of rape. It's a symbol of abuse, sodomy. Like, there's so many things that were done in the name of uh, the Confederacy um, to uphold the system of slavery uh, and systemic racism and white superiority and black inferiority. There are science experiments done on black people to test and to affirm white superiority. There were, I mean, the the horrific things that were done to black bodies in the name of science and medicine under um under under the 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 name of white supremacy as a, as an act of white supremacy mm-hmm. to uphold that institution, to uphold that flag, to uphold that symptom, that symbol. How in the world are we, how in the world is it not illegal to even fly a Confederate flag? How is it not, you know, illegal to have any Confederate relic? How is it not illegal to sing songs like Dixie? You know, I wish I were in the land of cotton. Old times there are not forgotten. Look away, look away, look away, Dixie land. I wish I was. Yeah, like, how is it not illegal to do that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think in, in Germany, I think the swastika is illegal, right? Right. Yeah. 
Um, so for any skeptics, let's let's just look at the history real quick. Um, Confederate flag. In response to Brown versus Board of Education, Georgia redesigned its flag to include the Confederate battle flag. <laughs> so wow. that was it was not to honor the Confederacy. It was yeah. because they're gonna send their kids into our schools with our kids. Here's how we're gonna show that we hate that. We're gonna redesign mm. our flag. Um, Florida in 1964, so right during the heart of the Confe- uh, of the Civil Rights Movement. Mm-hmm. Florida joined Georgia and South Carolina in flying the Confederate battle flag on its courthouse lawns. So it was in response to civil rights that we're going to put the Confederate flag up. Um, and then the the flags augmented this landscape that was already full of all these Confederate icons and uh, Confederate statues. Um, the flag, the Confederate flag, flew at rallies, uh, at monument dedications. It flew at school integrations. When uh, the first black children would come into a new school, there would be mobs of parents flying Confederate battle flags to protest against and intimidate these poor, innocent children yep. who are coming in so brave to uh, integrate schools. And the Confederate battle flag was used in counter protests at the lunch counter protests. Uh, it flew at, uh, on the sides of the voting rights marches that um, where like you see all the imagery now of like the dogs and the fire ho- the water hoses and everything. The Confederate flag was used on the march from Selma to Montgomery. Um, that's like the history of this flag. It was an, a symbol of white supremacy that was used whenever black people were were standing up and saying like, no, we aren't going to take this treatment. We deserve rights. It was used as a symbol of like the white supremacy aspect of Southern culture. Um, And so like for our listeners, white people, I think you might, there are people today who just don't know the history and they've bought the false narrative. They've bought the lost cause narrative. And there are people who in their heart think, um, I think somewhat like deceiving themselves, that like the Confederate flag is just a way to honor Southern culture. Um, So I I think like I'll grant that to some people that they think that, but that is a deception. Like they are believing a myth and a lie that's been created and it's been created by people who know better in order to propagate the use of the Confederate flag in order to continue to intimidate. Well, and let me just interrupt you. I'm sorry. But even thinking about the fact that there are Civil War reenactments that people can dress up <laughs> and reenact, like, do they do that in Germany? Do they, re- <laughs> like, reenact the Civil War and, 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 and herald it as, like, you know, this, like, even a fraternity was founded, after, like, as a result of, like, Confederate, the Confederacy, like, Kappa, Kappa Alpha. There's a, there, it's a white fraternity. I remember at the University of Memphis when I was there, they had black lawn jockeys hanging from trees. Um, they wear shirts that say, real, all men were equal until 1865. I remember when I was at UNT, there's a young white man that had that shirt on, and they had just this subtle, and, and not so subtle way of peddling this white supremacy and racism. And I was a resident assistant when I was uh, an RA at University of Memphis, and w- some of my residents were Kappa Kappa Alpha, and they had Confederate flags hanging like all over their. Um, um, well, we we lived in townhomes, um, so I was a RA over some townhomes, and they had them draped like huge draped. Uh, uh, all throughout their their town home, I remember just being defiant and going to an event at the Kappa Kappa Alpha house on purpose because I knew what they stood for. And I mean, walking in that building, and they were just appalled. And I was just like, "Hey guys, you know," because I was in a sorority. I'm I'm in a sorority, Zeta Phi Beta, um, and it's one of the African American sororities. Um, that eight of them were founded in the between 1906 and 1922. Most of them were founded on African American 
um, at African American universities. Most of them were founded at Howard University because, of course, we could not uh, go to white universities for the most part. And, of course, we couldn't be a part of white sororities and fraternities. So we started our own. But I remember um, that there, they, they told stories about how at the University of Memphis, Kappa Kappa, Kappa, Kappa Alpha in the 70s would ride around the campus on horses chasing black people, like intimidating black people. And when I was there in the 90s, they had black lawn jockeys hanging from trees. And many of us black students, we would come together and we would, you know, speak out and rally against them, but that they were able to have a fraternity house on fraternity row with black lawn jockeys hanging from trees and say, oh, no, and, and their, their motto, this is the crazy part, the real crazy part, their motto was, one of their mottos or their themes was, um, or mantras was to defend the uh, to preserve the what was it to preserve the honor and dignity of 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 Southern womanhood. Well, you know, Southern womanhood doesn't include black women. So they had this big thing about defending and protect, which is what the Confederacy was built on. It was built on we need to protect white women from black male savages who are going to rape and pillage because that's what they did. That's what they did to black women. They raped and pillaged. So the Confederacy is even built on the fear that they're going to get back what they gave, which was extreme, like, just horror, tr raping uh, black women, breeding black women. Um, I mean, that's the fear. That's, that's what undergirds this whole thing is that if we don't, you know, suppress them. If we don't keep them down, then they're going to do to us what they what we did to them. Mm -hmm. And so we got to, you know, enact all these fear tactics. But it's just crazy to me that even after the Civil War was lost, that these um, organizations like the Daughter of Confederacy, like Kappa Kappa Alpha, and they, Kappa Kappa Alpha, they did horrible stuff all over the country. And they were the collegiate KKK. They literally were the, you know, they were the guys in suits, but they were literally the KKK. Um, and they were doing crazy stuff all over the country on college campuses to further intimidate black people. Um, so they had, you know, just KKK operatives <laughs> in every aspect of life, um, in politics, in education, um, on college campuses, in medicine, in music. I don't know if you guys read the article um, recently about this professor basically calling out music theory as an act of racism, which is true um, because, you know, white institutions didn't want to b allow black people in. And a lot of times black people were creating the music that was being studied at white institutions, like jazz, how um, jazz was created out of in, 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 the, in, the, in the urban ghettos, jazz music was created, and then it was taken by white, white society, and they, they say they made a lady out of it, um, and then just re, reimagined, repackaged, repurposed, and then it, it becomes like this thing to study at universities all over the country. So universities that weren't even allowing black people to come in and be students, like University of North Texas, they had whole programs built on jazz music, which was created by black people, and to keep black people out and delegitimize um, the, the the origins of jazz, they they built this theory around it, this music theory, this sterile. A lot of times, jazz music does not translate into music theory. It does not translate on the page. And I'm a I was a music student, um, and so all of this all of this theory that they make you learn. Um, and it's discouraging to a lot of people, but, you know, to, to have to take some of these courses, it basically was, it, it was built to keep black people out of things that they even created. And when you think about that in a larger context, it's like the Confederacy was built to keep black people out of the country that we created on our backs and by our blood. Um, but just how how intricate all of this is and how intentional how people had to gather together and plot this demonic evil to, to erect statues, 
um, to intimidate, to, you know, put the put fear in the hearts of black people to make sure that black people stayed in their place, um, stayed on their side of the tracks. I mean, and this is what has continued. It's it's not gone away. It still exists today. It just continues to get repurposed, reimagined, restructured, and and made relevant for the time, um, for the time that we're in. Katina, talk to me about so the there's a Confederate statue that uh, was here in Denton. It actually was just recently taken down. But talk to me about like for the black community in Denton, what that like the feel of uh, walking through the square was in light of that. Well, I say this all the time, like a lot of people, you know, Denton has a lot of people because it's a college town, a lot of people who are not from here. Um, But for Dentonites, black Dentonites, a lot of times they don't go to the square. They don't go, they don't want to be anywhere near the square. Um, They don't engage in activities that occur on the square. A lot of times it's going to be people who are not from here. Um, and I, I remember coming here in the mid '90s as a student at UNT, and I didn't even notice the statue for the first few years. I didn't even, you know, because one, I, didn't, I hardly ever went on the square. But when we started going on the square, as restaurants started, you know, popping up, and you know, it, it was becoming like a, a place to be. I was like, one day, I was like, is that? What is that? You know, and and I'm like, is that a Confederate? Because, you know, driving by it or walking by it initially, I thought it was just some, I I thought it was like John Denton or somebody, you know, like, but I'm noticing that this is a Confederate statue and I'm like, what in the hell? What is this and how is this existing, you know, today? Um, but I found because I'm very um, close to I, I once when I came to Denton and we decided that we were going to you know get married and have kids we became very involved with Black Denton um, because it was just important to us if we we were going to raise kids here our kids need to know the Black people and the Black culture and the Black churches so we would do things with Moore Street Baptist Church and we attended St Andrew Church of God in Christ and. Um, and we were in Southeast Denton a lot for different things because we became a part of the black, you know, Denton family. Um, and there are families that have been here, you know, for generations. And I, you know, do events as a music mu- music person as a, and as a creative. And it was it's very hard to get people who are from Denton that are black to cross. It's like an invisible barrier where black people are still... Like, they don't want to go over there. They don't want to be over there. And it's like it's passed down generation to generation. One generation, they knew they couldn't go there. They knew they couldn't um, be there. You know, they were there and they knew, you know, their fam- they know they have family members who were um, brutalized or they experienced it firsthand. Well, they passed that on to their children and grandchildren. And it's, it's, it's a thing. And black people will go all the way to Dallas or different places where they feel more welcome. And Dallas has its own history, but, um, and not come to the square. And you don't see business, black businesses on the, on the square when there used to be black businesses on the square before they pushed them out. Um, and so it's, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible walking by a statue in 2020 because it just came down or 2019 or 2015 or 19 or whatever. And you have to explain to your kids why there's a statue that's erected to hate and domestic terrorism and oppression um, and celebrate it on the county square on property that is owned by the county government. Mm -hmm. And many of them were federally funded. They're like paid for, like black people paid taxes that funded Confederate statues being put up on court grounds so that to mark the fact that the law is not for you. Right. It's not to protect you. And then even during the protest, um, the city of Den PD, they marched with us, they were with us, and they, you know, offered a great measure of, you know, just protection um, shout out to uh, Chief Dixon, love him. But the county uh, officials got involved, um, and and we knew it was to protect that monument because what was happening was people were people were hanging they were hanging um, 
signs up on the monument that said Black Lives Matter. I mean, no one did anything destructive to that stupid thing. Um, if it disintegrated, I, I would have been happy. Um, but they would just hang Black Lives Matter. And so as that was happening, um, you see people from the sheriff's department, black, I mean, um, sheriff's uh, deputies, they'd be in the building while we're on the square lawn and they be taking our pictures. I, I've, I've had my picture taken many times while protesting on the square. And you knew that they were there to protect that monument. And then the monument, the monument wasn't, they didn't decide to move the monument um, until during the protest where they feared for the life of the monument. <laughs> mm -hmm. They feared for the life of, con of a concrete uh, statue and valued it more than they valued black people who were on the square crying out against injustice for, um, and just crying out for justice for Darius Tarver, um, crying out for justice for Lamont Stowers Jones, two young black men in Denton who uh, were killed due to injustice. And so it's just crazy to me. And so out of a desire to want to protect that statue, that was why they decided to take it down. And from what I understand, they're they're thinking about like making that taking that monument on some road show to schools to educate kids. Who, who why do we need that monument to educate kids about how horrible the Confederacy was? We can just look through history. And then Jessica Rommel, she was doing she started doing these um presentations like these lectures about the history and I mean it was like she had receipts y'all mm -hmm. I mean she had stuff where she was quoting different white pastors who had started churches she was listing their churches she was listing you know the organizations the daughters of confederacy she was I mean she because they let because they were so proud you know, those people were so proud at that time. They left so much documentation of what they were doing to their shame. Like, thank you for leaving all that documentation because now we can prove, you know, what your intentions were and that you were racist. Um, I mean, they left so much documentation and it, it, it wasn't hard for her to gather all of this. Um, and so she's reading all of this, you know, this this horrible history and just the efforts in Denton. Um, and then white supremacists start showing up to her lectures. I was there. Like, when one white supremacist stood up and just acted a complete fool in the middle of her lecture. Because they don't want to deal with their ugliness. They want to romanticize and they want to make it like it's something that was so noble and such a great cause and had nothing to do with black people and had nothing to do with slavery. And Jessica poured out all these receipts um, showing that it had everything to do with that. I mean, they used some very dark language about what their intentions were against black people in erecting that statue. And like you said, that tax money, black tax money, went to keeping that statue up, sustaining it, um, maintaining it. it, it, it's insane. It's insane. I've got a question. I, one thing, Garen, that you said earlier that I, I don't want people to miss is that in that poll about the Confederate flag, when when I think you said it was like eighty or ninety percent, ninety percent, ninety percent of black people that see that see it as like racist, and then you said white people were polled and it was fifty five percent. So just the majority of white people at this point in time in our country see the Confederate flag as racist. It's actually even more dramatic. It's actually, that was white Southerners. So in wow. the South, 55%. And this is actually the first time it's gone above 50% in the South. Yeah. Wow. Um, but uh, I think in response to Floyd. Um, so now at this point, the majority of white Southerners, so it would be an even higher majority of white people overall, see it as racist. Yeah, so... Let me ask you this, because I've, I see people all the time with Confederate flags, or they've got a Confederate flag keychain, or yep. they've got a, it's on a koozie, or, or, or sometimes it's like on a flag driving around the town. Uh, and maybe not so much <laughs> to, for what white people can do when they see that. I think maybe that might be pretty extreme. But like, if somebody has a Confederate flag keychain or something, what, what, what would be something that we could spark a conversation around to like ask because I think for me it, it's uncomfortable when I see the when I see confederate flag just in general and so it's like 
Uh, there's some times where I want to interact with people, but sometimes it's like people I know. Mm-hmm. And so how do I how do I start a conversation about somebody's Confederate flag, um, either artwork that's in their house or they're like, uh, it, or it's like on their keychain? Yeah. Well, I think I think a good word to use um, is actually unloving rather than racist in that situation because then if the person gets defensive and starts yelling it's like they're very directly proving your point because it's like showing that you're not motivated by love um, so to just saying like hey I see you have a confederate flag or keychain like did you know 90% of black people feel like that's racist when they see that and that that's then like not loving to your brothers and sisters um, and when you put it in those terms I think like it just kind of gets around some of the defenses because for a lot of white people, um, they define the word racist differently than uh, like the left does. Maybe that's something to get into real quick. On the left, when the word racist is used, it can mean either overt racism, which is like somebody like saying the N-word or somebody who's like directly hating someone because they're black. Or it could be more broadly talking about systemic racism, structures that are put in place that are unfair to black people. Um, Or it could be talking about um, just like white supremacy. On the right, or like for a lot of white people, when they hear the word racist, they think the definition of the word racist ends at hatred in your heart for black people. So then when white people hear the word racist, a lot of times they'll think like, you're accusing me of something, you're saying I have hatred in my heart for black people and you don't know my heart, so they'll get defensive. Like, how do you know what's going on in the inside? That's how white people can like keep a straight face when they say Trump's not racist because they're saying, you don't know what's in his heart, you don't know what motivated him to say those words. Whereas on the left, I think uh, like a lot of times black people, when they use the word racist, they're, they're, they're talking about like the effects of something. They're talking about like how it affects um, like that those words are objectively hurtful to black people, racially harmful. Um, and not just like trying to say what's in someone else's heart. So I think just like saying like, hey, that uh, it's unloving, uh, and to me, it's like hurtful that you, if it's a friend of yours, like say like, it's hurtful that you wear this, even knowing that it like is harmful to people who I care about. Um, and if you put it in those terms, where you're like a little bit more like coming. F- like from a heart level, rather than just saying like, hey, you're racist, and then they like get defensive and say like, no, and it, that even digs their heels in more because then they're like, um, like feel like you're saying something about them and they just want to like dig in. Yeah, well, and I struggle with all of that. I mean, I definitely can understand what you're saying in theory, and I realize that, you know, this podcast is Black History for White People and that um, you all are giving white people um, strategies in in ways that they can engage white people to kind of help ease the burden off black people um, in some ways. But it's so hard for me because it's like, it's just racist for whatever reason that it's racist. It's just racist. And I think that white people don't, they don't have to sit in the weight of their racism, whether it's, you know, um, whether it's subconscious racism, you know, whether it's inherited racism where they're doing what their grandmama and them did and it's racist, but they've never had to check their racism at the door and they have those implicit biases and they're racist, or whether it's, you know, systemic racism or whether it's whatever type of racism it is, it's still racism and it just it it it's a little triggering just to be honest i mean nothing on you but just it's triggering that we have to play with white people like this cuz mm-hmm. that's what it feels like mm-hmm. you know in our in black culture it's like i'm not going to play with you this is what it is mm-hmm. you know don't try to play you know this is the language we use like don't try to play games with me like you know what i'm talking about and then for us to have to coddle white people um <laughs> yeah. It's just crazy. Like it's just crazy as a from a black person um from a black perspective listening to how we have to engage white people to coach them through yeah. uh 
not being racist. It's like why, <laughs> it's exhausting. Like we have to be so sensitive that we're Woo! like careful with which word we use to tell you that not to racist. use a Confederate flag. Right. But then you are so insensitive that you're using a Confederate flag. Right. So like it's so imbalanced. And this is the crazy part that gets me is that white people, there's this whole okay, so my 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 former pastor who's like a spiritual father to me. He is um, Jewish. He's a Messianic Jew. And he has a very small, uh, you know, Bible teaching church in Lake Dallas. And I sat under his teaching. He's my pastor for six years. And there is this whole Jewish Illuminati thing that's going around by white conservatives where they are basically saying that Black Lives Matter and just anything that they deem liberal— because that's another thing is that they get to just throw everything in this so-called liberal basket um, while they hold on to their hate, to, you know, to substantiate holding on to their hatred. And so it's so intricate. Like it goes in there. This is their, this is the whole thing. It goes back to Jacob and Esau and basically Esau's revenge. So you see this a lot, like with white conservatives. I've had so many discussions about this whole, you know, basically it boils down to this Jewish alum, Illuminati. And it's so anti-Semitic and it's so racist. And they have studied this stuff down to, like, it's so intricate. But then it's so hard for you to, 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 to say that racism exists. Mm-hmm. Like, you have gone in, down this rabbit hole and they study so much. Like, they go out of their way to hold on to racism with these, with these made-up ideologies, this mythology. Like, it's like this, con- I call it, like, Confederate mythology. Like, they come up with the craziest crap to hold on to white superiority, white supremacy, and then you have this just simple, like, this simple, okay, he said this, he has a pattern of saying these things. That, look at where he said this. Look at where he's, did, he's done this. Look at where he said black people this or african American. Like, look at what he's done and it's obvious. And I got to prove it to you, but you're, you're, <laughs> you're believing in a whole Jewish Illuminati that started with Esau and you're using that to say that they're, you know, they're over that Illuminati that's existed for thousands upon thousands of years is somehow tied to Black Lives Matter while black bodies are swinging <laughs> from trees and black bodies are being annihilated and it, it's just it's just mind boggling it, 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 it's just I don't know it's just really mind boggling the stuff that white people get to do in the name of preservation self preservation to not look it's like there's a Starbucks cup or there's a glass of water but then you're gonna say that it's not a glass of water it's you know, and come up with all this stuff about why it's not a glass of water. It's like when it's a glass of water, just sitting right there. It's exhausting. Mm. It is really exhausting. I, it just in my conversations with white people who are trying to convince me that racism doesn't exist, they talk the same stupidity. They say the same dumb stuff. And they, it's, it's a whole school of thought that they bought into that they believe when it's racism is simply right there. And here's the history and here's the truth and here's the product and here's the residuals and here's the collateral damage and here's how it can continue. It's just so, it's just so cut and dry. Yeah. It just shows like the power of our need to justify ourselves. Literally. It's, it like actually makes us like completely irrational that whenever we, we have like, an emotional attachment to a position and we have to then build our framework for life around what we like can't let go of then you start to get more and more layers of like absurdity because we're like clinging to and unwilling to let go of something that we're that's actually irrational it's pharisaical it's literally the pharisees and sadducees trying to trip jesus up And then he just says something so simple and just mic drops and blows everything out of the water. That it literally plays out like that. Mm -hmm. Like why, why, why does, why did Jesus have to work so hard for people that 
knew him before anybody else knew him because he chose them to be his people um, and laid out in the scriptures, in the Old Testament, in the law, like, this is who I'm going to, this is who I'm going to be when I come, you know, to, to Moses said, uh, 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 a man, you know, someone's going to rise up from among our brethren, the Messiah that's promised to Eve. I mean, just laid out who he's going to be, what he's going to look like, how he's going to come into the earth, you know, come into the world. He was going to be born by a virgin. All the things like they like it's like Jesus fit the description in every way. And then his very people <laughs> who are supposed to be able to recognize him and the scholars of the scriptures, the ones who should who know the scriptures, who taught the scriptures, memorize. to memorize the scriptures, wrote the scriptures. Like when you wrote like the Torah, you had to get everything perfect or burn the scroll. Everything had to be perfect. So these scholars are the ones who don't even recognize him, and he's sitting right there in their midst. And that's the way I feel a lot of times about how white supremacy works is that, you know, white people claim to be, they, they, they've taken education, they've taken science, they've taken medicine, they've taken, you know, they're the, the scholars and the authority on everything. And then just for white sisters and brothers who are Christian to be the authority on the scriptures, you know, in America with the institutions that they built, the seminaries that they built that they excluded black people from, that black people built. And then, but you don't even recognize Christ in decrying racism. You don't even see, see Jesus's heart in why black lives should matter. Like, but you know Jesus so well because you've written all the books and the, why you had slaves, you know, John Edwards, like, why you had slaves? You you know you're you're one of the fathers of the faith in America. Like that 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 white churches still will put his picture up and say, "Oh, this is one of our fathers of the faith." But Jesus would have clearly said that Black Lives Matter because he said Samaritan women lives matter. Mm-hmm. Women who were about to be stoned, <laughs> uh, caught in adultery. Their lives mattered. I mean, <laughs> the lepers at the at the at the at the at the waters, their lives mattered. The man who was possessed by demons, his lives, his life mattered. And God was intentional to put these people's names in the Bible, to put their names in the scriptures or have their names recorded in the scriptures because they were the nobodies. They were the nobodies that if God had not spoken of them through the scriptures, we would not know that God's heart is for these people. When he says, love the sojourner, when he says, care for the oppressed, when he says, care for the marginalized, the widow, the orphan, what has enslavement, what has chattel slavery done in America? It has rendered people orphans. It has created many widows. It has killed more black babies than abortion has, even with abortion being a product of white supremacy that white people like to throw in our faces. It's just this, this, this demon, it's a demon. Confederacy, the Confederacy, white supremacy, it's, such, it's a tremendous demonic stronghold. I mean, it is a powerful, it has, it has Christians wrapped up. I think even of uh, Jesus in the one parable where he talks about the master goes, sends out invites to his party and all the people who were like the assumed people in privilege and power in the society, they all have excuses why not to come. So the master says, well, then go on into the streets and buy you and all the like gather the all the homeless people, all the poor people, all the like gather them and they'll come into the party. Yeah. And just showing like, like, I mean, that's Jesus teaching like God's heart and priorities and kind of like how the kingdom of heaven works is like, yeah. like, okay, there's like this reversal where now the people in the party are the people 
who weren't the ones that society thought should be there. Yeah, literally. Um, like that was Jesus' ministry. He was accused of being a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of sinners because he went out and after the people who society rejected. And who does our society reject if not black people and immigrants and like people, black and brown people who um, are not in the positions of power in our black in our culture? women? Yes, for mm-hmm. sure. Well, let's let's land the plane on this. Like, I think a lot of um, a lot of white people want to say that this is like you know you take the monuments away, you're gonna erase history, and you're gonna you know, and then you know it goes on from there. But what do we do? What do we do now? I mean, I know that another resource will probably continue to point you to at EJI. They they have a great like a monument. You can like put your address in, and it'll tell you monuments that are close to you, and you can. They have a lot of research on that, but like, what do you guys think we should do with the monuments? Like, do we just tear them all down? Do we? Yep. What do we do? Because because mm-hmm. I, I know that we what we collectively don't want to erase history, but we want to tell the truth. And so, what do we do? Continue. You're erasing power. You're erasing the demonic power, the demonic force. Like, if this is a Christian nation, what you are doing is tearing down strongholds. What you are doing is tearing down. Nebuchadnezzar's uh, uh, image. That's what you're doing. And do we not know Nebuchadnezzar's story? Is it not documented? Is it not a history that we have learned about and read about in biblical history for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years? Do we not know his story? Do we not know the full story? Yes. It did not erase the story. It, it the the monument needs to go because we need to erase the demonic stronghold and the power that it has. Like you, if you're a Christian, you cannot believe in golden calves. You cannot uphold you you cannot be a Christian and want a calf that has been fashioned by your own hands. You cannot want a golden calf. You cannot have it both ways. You either either tear down your strongholds and your idols. And look to the Lord, or you continue to uh, uphold these these statues, and you you don't belong to the Lord. You cannot love God and the Confederacy. You cannot love the Lord and cherish um, an abomination that oppressed and and killed and raped and destroyed an entire people group. Who do you value more? Stone, like like brick, like mortar, or beating hearts, souls? You cannot be pro-life, uh, pro-life if you love Confederate statues and if you believe that somehow history will be, history has never be, been erased. We believe in a God that we don't even see based on what is written in the Holy Scriptures. And he left he put in there everything he wanted us to know, everything he wanted us to read, everything he wanted us to see and understand, he put there. If we believe in the Lord, we cannot hold on to a, 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 a monument um, in the name of history because history is there. There's so much documentation. There's so much information about the Confederacy. There's so much information about enslavement. There's so much information about the history of this country. There's much information about colonization. And there are rape-colored skin Black people whose bodies are Confederate monuments, whose, whose, like our genealogies are made up of the Confederacy and the impact and the residual and the collateral damage of the Confederacy. You, there is a line that is drawn in the sand and you choose ye this day. (laughs) You're going to have to make a choice, Christian. Now, if you're not a Christian and you holding on to that, then, you know, I'm not talking to you because you've made your choice and you'll have your reward. But if you're a Christian, like, there's a reckoning, brothers and sisters, and you can't, you can't, you can't hold on to it. You can't hold on to a statue um, over a person that God has made. God, God has made people to be saved and to come in the, into the kingdom, not 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 statues. Yeah, there's a false history that the statues are there to protect and promote. 
So erasing the statues is erasing this false lost cause narrative, but they were never put there to remember real history. No. They were put there to glorify the Confederate. Uh, I mean, it, like literally in the Confederacy, it was wealthy white landowners that forcefully conscripted the sons of their neighbors. Like if you were a, a Southern white person, a uh, man, you were conscripted into the army. You were killed as a traitor if you didn't join. So you, you, the, your wealthy white landowning neighbors forcefully conscripted the sons of their neighbors to fight to protect their institution of slavery by which they derived their wealth. They sacrificed the lives of, what, millions of their fellow countrymen? Um, and, they, like, and then they lost that war. And then these monuments were put up to create like this false glorifying narrative about that, um, and it's so it's it's absurd that we glorify it like that slavery. Even the slaves that survived into American slavery were a fraction of the slaves that were kidnapped from Africa. So many died along the way. Like the death toll of slavery is higher than the total sum of all the slaves that that even made. It to America, yeah. and that we glorify that uh, that the, this false narrative like glorifies that institution um, is is absurd. So yeah, any any Confederate statue that was part of that false narrative, it just needs to come down. It serves no historical purpose. It's part of a false uh, myth of white supremacy. And uh, it doesn't it doesn't serve any redemptive purpose, and we need to be on the side of tearing them down. Thanks for listening to part one of this episode. Make sure to listen to part two, where we will be interviewing Mr. Willie Hudspeth and Miss Ruby L. Cole to hear of their own stories regarding the monument here in Denton, Texas. If you're looking for more information on what we discussed, take a look at the show notes or go to blackhistoryforwhitepeople.com. If you'd like to play a supportive role in the podcast and be able to vote for future topics and listen to full interviews, check us out on Patreon at patreon.com backslash black history for white people. Remember that all of the money you give in the first 10 episodes will go to the Denton African American Scholarship Foundation. We are going to be doing an interview later with the founder, so be on the lookout for that. We'll leave you with this quote from Keisha N. Blaine. Honoring a revisionist history of the Confederacy is not only repugnant, it also undercuts the argument of those who now claim they only want to preserve history.